GNC 565. It's Tuesday, April 6th, and you're listening to the Geek News Central Podcast, sponsored by GoDaddy.com. Geek News Central is a proud member of the Tech Podcast Network. Hey, I've got a great show for you, and wow, lots of stuff to talk about. Uh, obviously, the big news over the weekend was the iPad, but uh, lots more to talk about as well. You know what comes next. Strap in. Here it comes. All right, people, I need a go no go for the Geek News Central podcast. Digital archive recorders. Here go, Fly. Microphone. Here go, Fly. Video feed. Go. Web browser. Go. RSS data stream aggregator. Go, Fly. Interflux Toddism suppressor. All right, I'm confused. Host readiness check. Welcome to the show. Welcome to the show. The Geek News Central podcast is a proud member of the Tech Podcast Network. If it's tech, it's here. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we are ready to go. Q Todd in five. Button, button, who's got the button? Four. There is no cause for alarm. Three. Everybody hold on to something. Two. Just press the button. One. It's showtime. Aloha and welcome to the Geek News Central podcast coming to you as live as it can be from the beautiful state of Hawaii via the Geek News Central studio overlooking Greater Oahu. Have we got a great show for you lined up again? My name is Todd Cochran. Of course, I encourage you to get over to geeknewscentral.com and uh, check out all the archive podcasts available via the podcast link on the website. Of course, you want to check out our great blog articles for all our contributing uh, bloggers over there, Geek News Central as well. But uh, a little late start to the show tonight. Uh, had to have some dad duties uh, dealing with a uh, teenager. I guess that's for a better word. <laughs> So, uh, but I got a great show lined up for you. Nonetheless, a lot of stuff to talk about. I want to give a warm welcome to all of the uh, new listeners to the show. And of course, I want to say hello to all the Ohana, all the folks that have been longtime subscribers to the show. Those of you that are part of our basically extended family. And don't worry if you're a new listener, you uh, basically you're automatic, you're automatic accepted into the Ohana. And of course, being I live here in Hawaii, Ohana is uh, basically means family. So, Welcome to the Ohana. Uh, make sure you get signed up for our newsletter. The newsletter contains everything I'm going to talk about tonight. It contains all the links to all the shows, uh, to all of the, uh, all of the uh, links to all of the articles I talk about during the show. So uh, that'll that'll have uh, lots of great content for you to review as you're as you're listening to the show here. Um, of course, you want to subscribe to the show as well. That'll get you uh, dialed in so that you don't never miss an episode. You can do that via iTunes, Zoom Marketplace, or your favorite podcatcher on either whatever mobile device you may have. Or if you just recently picked up an iPad, you can uh, subscribe and you basically listen or watch on the iPad. Matter of fact, I was actually watching. I probably should have queued this up. Um, I was actually watching Geek News Central's video on the iPad, and it was a pretty good experience. It really, really was. So. Um, one thing that I have found is obviously putting the YouTube embed on the website of Geek News Central has allowed uh, those of you that are using an iPad or a mobile device to actually get access now to the video content directly on the website because they made the HTML5 uh, available to you. So basically, or the H it's HTML5 enabled so that you get the uh, the raw video, which is cool, and it really did. It played very, very well. Um, on the iPad, so I'm pretty excited about that. Actually, Geek News Central looked pretty good um, on the device. That's always a big worry. You never know how it's really going to look, and I think it scaled pretty well. Um, wow, what a weekend. Very, very busy around here. Um, Saturday, the uh, the missus had a very long list of uh, yard work for me to do. <laughs> and generally what we do is because I'm so busy, I'm gone so much, um, I actually hired someone to come in and do the yard from time to time when I'm not here. But uh, she had uh, a bunch of plants to plant and some new trees and some shrubs to take down. Uh, so needless to say, I am scarred from one end to the other with uh, little scratch marks from thorns and stuff. So it was, it was a fun Saturday morning. And then Saturday afternoon, UPS rolled up. To my great surprise, because Hawaii was supposed to be on the delayed list in other words we thought, didn't think we were going to get our ipads until today and lo and behold they rolled in the guy dropped off the jumped off the truck with that box and i was like uh honey i need to go inside for like an hour <laughs> she was not having any of that so the box sit on the counter in the kitchen for about an hour my kids are like what's in there what's in there i said just wait 
<laughs> so we all got to uh, we opened it up, played around with it, and uh, big hit here so far. Even uh, my wife, who is really not inclined on geeky stuff, thought it was pretty impressive. So uh, there may be another one of these coming to the uh, Cochran household at some point. Uh, who knows? But we'll see. I'll talk a little bit about more of that here in a few minutes. Um, hope all of you made your Wi-Fi changes to your SSID uh, within your Wi-Fi devices in your homes. I hope you've set those to geeknewscentral.com. And that basically gives me a little free advertising in around your neighborhood. Hope you've got that set up. And, uh, of course, um, something new. If you have are so inclined and you're artistic in nature and you decide that you can create some swag for the show, in other words, some T-shirts, some coffee cups, ball caps, whatever it may be, if you come up with some cool stuff and set up a little online store and send me a link to that, um, go ahead and do that. And when you do, then I'll basically tell the audience about it so they can go out. Because really what I am finding is a lot of the stuff that I've wanted to do for a very long time just has not happened because there's just not enough time cycles in a day to get it all done. So I thought it would impair upon the audience, hey, we've got a lot of great fans of the show. If they want to create something for the show, let them put it up. Make a few bucks at it, and if you know if you feel so inclined, uh, send me a few dollars from the earnings, and uh, that way we both are happy and we make some cool stuff for the show. So if you're into making T-shirts, coffee mugs, whatever it may be, I give you guys free license to go ahead and uh, and and do what you want with the logo and so forth. And I can actually make that available to anyone that wants it, and uh, just get creative. Let's do some cool stuff together. On the last show, I had promised all of you that we would have the big announcement. Well, at about uh, 5 o'clock Eastern today, I called uh, Angelo, our lead developer at Raw Voice. I said, Angelo, have you gotten word back from the vendors? And he said, no. <laughs> so I really wanted to share with you guys tonight what, uh, what we're supposed to be announcing tomorrow. But uh, we may not be announcing tomorrow. <laughs> it all depends on if we get some emails in the morning. I don't know. But I uh, can't tell you tonight. I feel bad. I had really, I thought everything was going to come together. All signs and indications were uh, Friday that we would be, uh, we would be ready to pull the trigger uh, basically this afternoon. And it didn't happen. So um, get me a little nervous. But, uh, you know, just like a fine wine. Everything takes a little time, <laughs> and uh, I promise you, I think all of you will be very excited once we put the word out uh, because we have clued a few people in, and so far, those individuals are pretty stoked with uh, what, we're, uh, what we're announcing. They're pretty excited. Uh, one guy said uh, some expletives that I can't even say in this show, <laughs> um, so... It's coming. I can't, uh, we can't do anything at this point, but I will definitely, uh, as soon as, basically, you're probably going to find out via the blog on Geek News Central and over at Raw Voice uh, before the next show. But uh, no matter what, I'll share with you. I'm, but there's going to be no choice. By Thursday, um, I'm going to have to let the cat out of the bag one way or the other. But uh, we're hoping that the vendors that we are working with um, are ready. Uh, hopefully tomorrow it's the big uh then i'm gonna if not i'm gonna be picking up the phone and making some uh some phone calls uh probably be um another week and a half or so before the first geek new central insider newsletter goes out uh the geek new central insider will be not only uh content from a uh as a news newsletter format we're also going to make some very specific uh, audio and video available for you as well and again, uh, the Geek News Central Insider goes to anyone that becomes a silver contributor or above. And you'll find a link to basically my salary replacement plan on Geek News Central itself. So we hope that you uh, will get involved and help me replace my salary. And at the same time, you'll get a little extra benefit by being on the uh, Geek News Central Insider that I'll be producing uh, every couple of weeks or so. The... Also, silver contributors, uh, if they contribute for a year, get a T-shirt. And the platinum contributors for a year get a polo shirt. And uh, with the lawyer and uh, basically accountant approval, we're going to be setting aside a pool of revenue from revenue earned on advertising for the show for revenue sharing for those that are actually platinum contributors. Kind of a cool way to get back. Again, wait approval from that for the accountant and uh, the lawyer. 
So let's talk a little bit about the iPad here before we get into uh, the regular show content. But, you know, everyone's seen this thing. You know, every, every there's there's 300,000 of my guests that are out. And of course, you know, everyone's seen it, so I, I really don't need to show it to you. Um, but I will say, for those of you that haven't seen one yet, the screen is remarkable. Um, I've shown this around today to a number of people, and everyone I basically basic, you know, showed it to wanted to touch it and play with it. And there was a few times I was actually in locations where there was no Wi-Fi connection, and that really makes the experience poor. Uh, you, this thing has got to be connected um, in order to really make use of it in a traveling sense. I can see right now that you're going to have to have the 3G version of this uh, when this comes out. The Wi-Fi version is cool as long as it's staying in your house and you know the locations you're going to go to with it have Wi-Fi. Otherwise, don't buy it, really. It's, uh, it's not a useful tool without connectivity because this, this is all about being connected. Now, I, I downloaded some iPhone apps that were not iPad corrected, and what this is going to result in is every developer that has an app out there, they're going to have no choice. They're going to have to make another app because the experience was horrible for many of the apps I, that I downloaded that were originally designed for the iPhone but not for the iPad. But the, the, uh, the actual apps that were set up for um, specifically for the, uh, for the iPad and were – uh, you know, specifically designed. Um, give an example: the USA Today app is absolutely amazing. And as I'm not a USA Today reader, but I was looking through this, and as I talked about using my Kindle to read a newspaper, it really wasn't a great experience. But using the um, reading USA Today on the iPad was pretty impressive. It really, really was. Um, because everything just seemed to flow. Uh, played around a little bit with a couple other magazines and uh, wasn't as impressed. The AP one was pretty cool. But I will say the app that I probably thoroughly enjoyed the most last night was we had gotten caught up on Lost. And it turns out that when my TV was broke, the, uh, the DVR did not pick up the last version of Lost that we had missed. So I had actually loaded the ABC app onto the iPad. Um, I was in, uh, by this time it was like 11.15 at night. Uh, went into the bedroom, uh, basically started it, not knowing what the experience would be, and sat there and watched the, uh, the previous week's uh, episode of Lost. It was great. It really, really was. Now, I'm in bed. I just have this thing sitting in my lap, kind of propped up with a pillow, laying sideways. It was perfect. The audio was good, wasn't too loud, wasn't too quiet. Um, just was a, a real awesome experience for uh, watching Lost. And my Wi-Fi connection kept up. It never buffered. So from that perspective, it was really, really good. Now, I played with uh, a couple other apps. The WordPress app to see how blogging would be on it. It's okay. Um, the mail, this is, you know, one thing I will say about this device. If you are used to full-featured applications on, now for those of you who don't have an iPhone or don't have a mobile device, you guys know that most of those applications are pretty dumbed down. They really are very basic. There's no real feature set to them. And I will say that this is the case with the iPad, at least so far. Most of the applications are pretty dumbed down. I mean, they're just idiotic, simple, doesn't require any thinking by any means or stretch of imagination. Um, the Pages application by Apple, a $9.95 in App Store, was is pretty good too. It's real impressive. It looks real nice when you've got it loaded. And, you know, it, it looks fancy. And everything there is to be edited. But... I really wonder if they added this really in this application or if they didn't do it on a Mac and then import it because I wouldn't want to do some of the stuff they've done in this without it. Um, it just seems like it would have taken too long. So, you know, I, while obviously you can do pages in the app with this application, 
Um, you know, I don't know. We'll have to see over time. But I think um, one thing that I was watching was just as I was getting ready to go to bed, the space shuttle was getting ready to launch. So I thought, well, this would be cool. Let me go over to NASA.gov and let me see if the shuttle launch will actually um, be carried, if I can actually watch it on the iPad. So I went over to NASA.gov, loaded it up. Of course, all the Flash players, uh, Real Player, Windows Media, all that went work. But there was a link there for QuickTime, QuickTime Streaming. And I thought, oh, for sure, this thing will do um, streaming. So I clicked on the QuickTime link, and it just sat there. It didn't do anything. So from near as I can tell, there is really no streaming uh, capability on the, um, um, on the device as far as QuickTime goes. Now, that's the exception. Let me tell you about Twit's app. And I'll be have to admit, I will say hands down, Leo Laporte has got this thing figured out because they have come up with an app, and I'm going to probably hire the company that built his app to do my, do my own streaming app. Let's see if I can find it. It's called TwitPad, and any of you that watch Leo's show and have an iPad, you've got to get one of these. So let me show you. It's actually, is Twit going to come up and, and play? Okay, so right here is Leo's show. So Leo's talking. Um, there, this is a previous recorded show. Below it is a schedule. And then I can go and click. There's a little button, and I can actually click. And for those of you on Ustream, you've seen this. This is the, for the audio audience. There's a little chat button. And you can actually chat with the device. And, well, this today, it's actually asking me to do something a little different. Okay, so it's loading the app. Um, so this thing is the bomb he has really figured this out you can chat you can see the schedule you can it's really really good and uh you can just sit and i i watch it for had it run, running for like two hours had it set up here on the side of my of my desk and just let it run every once in a while i look over and hear and heard it and i think my biggest takeaway so far so far folks is if this is got on a stand and i want to look at something interactive this can almost be my third monitor to a certain extent. Again, it's a dumb monitor. It only does certain things. The limitations are within the app itself. But overall, uh, just a few apps that I've tried, uh, pretty good. And again, anyone can use this thing. Uh, my daughter was crazy about it. And uh, there was actually some uh, books that were loaded. Uh, Dr. Seuss book came loaded with it. And I actually showed that to my youngest son, and he was pretty jazzed because, you know, pictures, bright screen, technology. So I can see where people are going to be fighting for this thing to use it in the house. Now, um, why? I guess maybe because it's the newest toy, the newest gadget in the house. But at the same time, I think that um, the kids will use it. We'll see how much. And I'm going to let, you know, each of them have a shot at using it for a couple of days in a row by themselves and see what they get out of it and uh, what they can do with it because they're probably going to think of stuff to do that I'll never think of doing. I haven't loaded any games on it yet, uh, but uh, my son is like, what kind of games, what kind of games can we get? So I'm sure he'll be uh, excited to do that. So anyway, again, if you, of course, Pandora was on there, ABC, TwitPad, WordPress, USA Today, Dragon was the uh, one I tested as well. Um, again, pretty cool. So I guess we'll see. We'll, you know, we'll know more in 60 days if I'm still using the thing on a daily basis, whether it's worth it. Um, hey, you know, you know where I took it, fellas? <laughs> and ladies, uh, please don't take this the wrong way. This is the perfect geek device for the throne room. It really is. <laughs> I mean, it's, you know, you don't take your laptop into the bathroom. You don't take, you know, you take your newspaper, right? Oh, no. Oh, no, this thing is, uh, <laughs> it's going to have some, uh, some usage in the, uh, in, in the throne room. Now, one thing I did notice after holding it for a couple of hours and playing with it, I think I got iPad carpal tunnel syndrome because it is, it's, it's heavier than what I thought it would be. So um, anyway, that's my experience. We have some more articles we'll share at, uh, during the show tonight. We'll do it a little bit here um, in a few minutes when I get into the regular content. But I do want to share one last thing with you that happened to me 
Um, booted up a machine that I use on a regular basis, uh, Windows Vista, and it blue screen, and it blue screen, and it blue screen like five times in a row. Couldn't figure out what was going on. Um, was thinking, oh, man, here we go. Going to have to restall. For the first time ever in my entire, and I have multiple Windows machines sitting here. For the first time ever, I had to actually do a recovery. Go back, and I I'd never done it. So I was like, F8, and okay, what do I do next? And pick a recovery point. I picked one like four days prior when I know that there hadn't been some updates and stuff submitted to it. And went through that process, and everything booted up, and the machine was good. But of all these years, I've never had to use Windows Recovery. And uh, it worked. So... <laughs> Uh, I guess consider myself lucky. Knock on was don't know what was wrong with the machine. Uh, hopefully he doesn't do it again. But uh, that's the way it is. Now let me go ahead and see if I can get through my list here, make sure I've gotten everything covered before we get into the uh, the regular content. Uh, looks like I've gotten down through my list. Uh, stickers and swag, i got a bunch of stuff ready to go. So hopefully that will go out in the mail tomorrow. Uh, so those of you that are sending stuff, uh, please do so. And actually I got corrected by... Uh, we'll talk about that at the end of the show by one of our listeners who uh, basically was saying, Todd, you're, you're saying it wrong. <laughs> and you guys will figure out what we're talking about then. Um, hey, if you've got comments on today's show, geeknews at gmail.com, geeknews at gmail.com. Voice email hotline is 619-342-7365. Let's take a few minutes here and uh, take care of a little sponsorship, and then we'll we'll get into the rest of the content for the night. Hey, GoDaddy, GoDaddy.com. If you're looking for domain names, virtual dedicated servers, shared hosting accounts, whatever it may be, I want you to go over to GoDaddy.com. My good friends over there have been sponsoring this show for basically five years now and uh, longtime sponsors, and really, we want you to support them. They keep the lights on here, folks. They really, really do. And uh, so when you're considering a new domain name, a dedicated server, shared hosting account, whatever it may be, get over to GoDaddy.com, and don't forget me when you get to that checkout counter because I got some promo codes for you. And you can find them basically right on the website, GoDaddy promo codes listed on the second column of the website, or actually first column of the website. And, uh, of course, I've got some great ones for you. ComSale will get you $7.49.com domains. Todd will save you 10% on non-domain orders. Geek5 will save you 15% on any order, $20 or more. Central will save you $10 off any order, $50 or more. Aloha will save you $20 off any order, $75 or more. Todd20 will save you 20% on a one-year shared hosting account. Now, here's a little tip for you all, all right? In July, the domain name registration system prices are going to increase, okay? So if you've got domains that are going to start coming up for renewal, um, after July, consider renewing them in June because, or even this month, or you know, because you're going to save yourself some money because all prices on all domain registers in the entire world are going to go up in July. So make sure you get out there and register early. I think they're only going to go up like 15 to 20 cents, I think, is what the, the price is going to go up. But it's enough that if you've got 236 or some domains like I do, um, it's, you know, it's, it'll save you some money, um, over the long run. So consider doing your renewals early. A com sale is a code that you can use for your .com renewals, of course. So thanks for GoDaddy for being a longtime sponsor here at, uh, at Geek News Central. Use them, love their products. I uh, got a number of their, a number, all of my basic sites are on, on GoDaddy servers. And, uh, you know, thank goodness, knock on wood, everything's been good for years, so, um, of course, you know, now they say that, something Murphy's Law will strike. But uh, great great product, great service, as well as GoToMeeting. Been using GoToMeeting now. Gosh, I can't, I can't imagine not living with this product or not doing business with this. I, I can live with, not live without it, <laughs> but I can't do business without it. And really, there's an old way to meet for business. It's over phone or flying somewhere, a meeting in person across town. But uh, as I filled my car up, it was like uh, three nineteen. I think I paid for gas. Uh, was it three nineteen or three seventy nine? One of the two it was pretty high. Um, you know, just to drive across town is you know a couple round trips. That's twelve, thirteen, fourteen dollars. Uh, just you know for a single meeting. Really, there's a new better way: meet clients and colleagues online with GoToMeeting. 
And I use this product every single day, multiple times a day. And really, it's the best way to do business. It's the best way to meet with other people. It's voice IP is included. You don't have to pick up a telephone. You just load the application. And, and I use my little trusty uh, webcam here that's got a speaker on it. I use that for the, uh, for the microphone. And uh, just talk with them. And, you know, they can see what you see. If, they, if you want to see their screen, you can tr transfer it so that you can see their computer screen as well. Um, host sales presentations, training meetings, whatever it may be. Um, and with GoToMeeting, brought to you by Citrix, you can host as many meetings as you want for one low flat rate. Um, as a listener of this show, you can try GoToMeeting free for 30 days. That's a month of unlimited meetings free. For this special offer, visit GoToMeeting.com slash techpodcast. That's GoToMeeting.com slash techpodcast for a free 30-day trial. Link will be up in the show notes. Of course, there's a banner up on the website. Don't forget, if you forget about what it is in the actual show notes, just go to the website and click on that. That'll get you there as well. And uh, give, give that uh, product a 30-day trial. We definitely appreciate Citrix here for a longtime sponsor of the show. All right, let me go ahead and uh, bust into the regular content. Woo, time is smoking. Has it actually been that long, or is that uh, computer acting funny? Let me look at my other timer. No, we're on. Wow, we're we're way long. I talked about the iPad for a while, so I've got a pile of stuff here, folks, and the regular show notes. Holy cow! I can't believe it. I guess I talked that long on that, didn't I? So, <laughs> anyway, let's go ahead here and uh, bust into the uh, the regular content for tonight. The folks at Google. Apparently, because of the way the economy is, has implemented some new, basically, responses to search engine queries. Last week, if you were doing any type of Googling about suicide, uh, doing anything about uh, talking about uh, ways to kill yourself in your Google searches, and uh, God forbid there's anybody in the show that listens to the show that's having any problems, and if you are, please pick up a telephone. And, and call the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline. They, they def, and they're there for anyone. Um, but Google started presenting um, an icon of a red phone and a toll-free me toll number to th exactly that, the National S uh, Suicide Prevention Lifeline, as a way to you know, say, hey, if you need help, go here. And apparently this is only the second time, this is according to the New York Times, this is the only second time that Google has added such guidance on troubling search terms. So um, they also provided a phone number for the National Poison Control Hotline after search, uh, searches like poison emergency and that type of stuff. So um, I guess the idea came from a Google user, and I hope they keep this in place. This, you know, this is, uh, this is good because when you are in a panic, First of all, do any of you have a phone book? Can you find a regular phone book? I, I don't think I can find a phone book. You know, my first reaction would be, you know, to for poisoning would be to dial 911. I wouldn't even think about probably going to Google and looking. But when people are contemplating things, um, this is a great way to kind of technology-wise get them some help. And uh, I think this is a good stewardship of Google resources, and I hope that they continue doing this in a way that will help people when they're we're looking for information that may indicate something is amiss. And um, but this, this poison emergency phone line, I think that's perfect for a, you know, again a pop up or a little badge that says, "Hey, here's the number, uh, dial it now." So very very cool. Okay. You know, with the iPad, there's all kinds of idiots out there. There's the guys that smashed one with a, a baseball bat. They got uh, some coverage on from the L.A. Times. You know, got their five minutes of uh, fame. But you got to hand it to the folks at Will It Blend. <laughs> they, um, they definitely did a number on the, uh, on the iPad. And uh, the, uh, it underwent the treatment that... Uh, you know, so many other devices have went under. Now, let me see if I can actually um, play this here on the show, see if this will actually, of course, some advertisement pops up. Isn't that, 
that just drives me crazy. You know, I went on CNN today, and they had an advertisement on their site that was, like, I'm not kidding you, was took up at least half of my screen and is all the way across. I, I took a screenshot of it. I have it uh, on another PC, but I have never seen an ad that was literally, and I, those of you on Ustream, it was this big on the screen. It was huge. So let me go over here and see if I can put this up for all of you that are on Ustream. See if we can listen to this or have a little fun with this because do you think the iPad can uh, can blend? <laughs> so let's see. Will it blend? That is the question. It is the question. So he's showing, uh, of course, their little intro here. And uh, now the problem is, how is the iPad going to fit into the blender? I love my new iPad. It does a ton of cool things. But will it blend? That is the question. That is the question. Doesn't quite fit in the jar. Nope. But I can take care of that. So watch. This. You guys are not, those of you that are listening, but he's taking the iPad and he's smashing at the side of the blender. I, the, the screen is just shattering into, oh, this is just heart-wrenching to see this. So he's hit it at least four or five good times. Now he's bending it in, into it. I knew I could get the iPad in a blender, oh. a total blender. I think I'll press the I blend button. I blend. <laughs> so this takes a while. You can see they keep cutting away and coming back and cutting and coming back. It's take it's taking a while. And he's sitting there kind of looking, you know. <laughs> oh my gosh, you should see this. So you'll be able to find this on YouTube, but Oh, yes. Oh, pad smoke. Pad smoke. Don't breathe this. <laughs> Don't breathe it. You know, he's got all those battery chemicals and everything in there. Oh, my gosh. That is just, oh, you see, $499 flush. But what an ad. <laughs> and it must have took a while because it blend and blended and blended and blended and blended. But it just turned into this, like, powdered mush you know i i almost wonder it he should not be wearing a respirator when he does that because <laughs> it can't be healthy it cannot be healthy it really can't so uh anyway it blended so those of you that were not so much ipad fans you'll want to be able to go over and watch that um, over on engadget they talk about um, ipad apps news and magazines about the Im implementation of it and the differences um and, of course, USA Today right now, great model. It's free because they found sponsorship for it through July. So that's that's good news on the um, – as far as USA Today, all the rest of the uh, newspapers and stuff you have to pay for. Um, now, if you have a website of your own and you don't have an iPad yet, uh, don't worry. You, how to view the iPad-ready websites via your Firefox web browser. I have a link to an article on this. Um, but they've got a um, an add-on called a user agent switcher, and it basically creates a iPad uh, profile on Firefox, so that you can actually go to your website and take a look. I'll have the link up in the show notes for you to do that. Now, there's another site that's being promoted as well that will do the same thing. It's called iPad Peak. Here's the thing: don't even waste your time. It's not. Uh, they're not. They're just basically wrapping your website in like this outline of an iPad, but they're not really showing you what your site really is going to look like. They don't wrap the text. They don't show the type size. Uh, they don't uh, show whether your graphics work or not. They don't uh, truly replicate images. So stay away from the iPad peak. Go over to the Firefox app and, and try that. So who really bought the iPad over the weekend? A quick survey of 444, 400, and this is an article on ehomeupgrade.com. And actually, let me bring this up in the, uh, in the other browser here so that you guys can see this. Um, according to this survey that was done, 448 users, 74% um, of the buyers were Mac users. That should not come as any surprise. 66% uh, of them also owned iPhones. And 78% of them said they consider buying nothing else 
in terms of a similar or compatible gadget. Um, as for the iPad replacing the computer, 96% they'll use both. Um, now, the one thing that stood out is that they're, according to this article, is that iPad Bear said they would use the device primarily for surfing web, followed by reading books and email, playing games and apps came in just at 18%. So, you know, I don't know if I'm going to use this for surfing the internet because I did some page load uh, replications and basically seeing which, what works faster. My laptop beat the iPad hands down for speed and loading websites. And it was just a better, better experience. Um, so if I'm just sitting around and I, you know, I'm twittering or I'm doing something, you know, I think that's where I'm going to use the device and it's going to be, again, it's a luxury item, I think at this point for most people. So, um, we'll see. And I'll find out really after 60 days, whether or not, uh, um, it's something that I'm going to use on a regular basis. Uh, according to Apple, 300,000, uh, iPads were sold. People are saying that's an underestimated number that uh, Apple has probably uh, announced lower numbers than what actually was done, which doesn't make any sense. But one thing that we found, and even I know Angelo over at Raw Voice, he's been, we've been working really hard to get all our sites HTML5 compatible. We're putting out a new website design, and we're trying to build so that when people come to the site with an iPad or with a mobile device, it's a better experience. So web developers have been working overtime. So I've got a pretty good article here uh, from PC World that talks about the demands that this device has made on web developers. And it's been very significant. And like I said in the previous show, nothing else will push HTML faster than this device. Now, not to be outdone, HP has announced their HP Slate, Slate pricing. Uh, so HP Slate versus the iPad. Now you're sitting on the, sitting on the shelf trying to figure out what you're going to actually buy. And if you're going to buy a Slate or, or the iPad, well, in terms of processor speed, graphics, in, the, in reference to ports, to software actually being an operating system, to actually having cameras on board, the HP Slate wins hands down. The price is going to be between five forty nine and six hundred bucks, but the advantage on the iPad side is the screens. Definitely, man, hands down, wow, huge on the, the screen quality. Um, connectivity, uh, the iPad has Wi-Fi. I wish it had a place where I could actually connect via a network, as well. Um, you know, just some like a little adapter or something, but that's not possible because there's sometimes I go places where there's no Wi-Fi connectivity. Battery life. I watched three hours worth of video and only had 9% of my battery go down. That was, to me, just blew me away. Three hours of video, 9% was the uh, discharge rate on the battery. So anyway, the HP Slate pricing is out. actually talked with someone this actually on Saturday as well that had gotten hands on one of these. And it was telling me a little about it, about it and it uh, could be big. And I think what you're going to see is this, these are going to be great devices for consuming uh, video and audio podcast, uh, especially the video shows like mine that are you know available. Actually, the audio show is the primary audience, but I think it will continue to build the, vis the video listening audience or watching audience of this show. So pretty excited about that. Okay, let's move off the iPad. Let's get into what else is going on in the news. So that was my whole segment. We'll move on. And now from now on out, it'll just be periodic stuff. So you guys had your fill, I'm sure. <laughs> but uh, Robin Good over at masternewmedia.org has got a um, good review on what type of hosting to pick on shared, virtual, dedicated, co-located, how to choose the right hosting solution. Um, I hope you'll go with GoDaddy, but this gives you lots of ways to pick what is the best solution that you're going to need for a website or or e-commerce site that you're going to launch so uh i'll have this link up in the show notes you can check it out lots of good information there on that uh, five must have free windows 7 utilities and this is uh jk on the run at jk on the run dot jk on the run dot com and i was looking through these and I have never loaded a couple of these. One I'm familiar with is, is called C Cleaner. Um, 
just like any other Windows machine, it does require some housekeeping. Sleek Cleaner is a free utility that keeps pesky Windows registries lean and mean. Uh, there's a wireless network meter that's pretty cool. I loaded that up on there. haven't seen that one before. Um, Rocket Dock. I've never heard of this. It's a use by on, um, on a variety of Windows systems, but uh, what it does, it's a good way to, with, to have one-click access to programs that you use the most. It's for those with, with smaller screens, so I thought that was a pretty cool one. But anyway, here are seven free utilities uh, that you can use on Windows 7 that's recommended by the folks at jcanderun.com. Every once in a while, you see something on a website, and even though it's non techy you just got to share it. And uh, for those of you that are listening on the show, this will be a Gizmodo article that is basically, probably I'll entitle it in the show notes, called Chainsaw. And let me actually bring it up here on the, uh, for those of you on Ustream, and let me show you this. Um, what this is, is, for a better word, a monster chainsaw. This thing is actually a boat with a chainsaw attached to it, and all it does is cut ice. <laughs> um, this thing is looks wicked, and uh, it's used in Russia to uh, cut ice, I guess, out of uh, what they're calling the River Devina. Uh, I can't even pronounce this Russian city. Uh, it's on the coast of the White Sea. But uh, this looks like something, if, if my dad was still alive, that uh, he would attempt to make in the backyard. I, you know, it's one of those things, that, uh, one of those projects when you know, whoever dreamt this thing up was definitely one of those guys that has one of those machine shops. They're, you know, they're cold winter. You know, hey, bro, why don't, uh, we, why don't we make an ice-cutting machine? And, and, yeah, it's got a float. And <laughs> um, this thing is insane. So uh, I just had to – it just looked too cool. I said, when I first saw it, I couldn't believe it. But uh, it's the real deal, and I guess it cuts ice very well. So I'll have the link up to it in the show notes. All right, let's talk a little bit about uh, processor chips. March was a big month for – Really, the between Intel and AMD, there was a you know pretty big battle on number of chips being released last month. Um, AMD launches 12-core Optotron 6100 processor, code named the MagniCures, on the 29th, and Intel finished off the month with the launch of an 8-core uh, Xeon. And while all's being said, you think about 12 cores, you know obviously these are going to go in upper end servers. But uh, this AMD launch of its 12-core processor with clock speeds between 1.7 and 2.3 gigahertz um, is pretty impressive. Uh, it's aimed at two and four socket configurations. And uh, so, really, if you are in the market for new heavy, hardcore, heavy lifting server, imagine 12 cores per chip. It's just simply remarkable, um, the power that must be behind these things. But uh, uh, if you follow this space, you know, how many, where are we going to go? How many cores are they going to be able to put on a single chip that we're going to be able to use essentially in our own desktops, um, you know, for home base use? That's the question I want to know. You know, where are we going with that? But uh, pretty impressive, 12 cores on a single chip. There's a pretty good article on ArsTechnica.com, and I had to laugh when I read this because, you know, AT&T has for years tried to dominate and own everything. You know, the federal government uh, uh, broke up the bells uh, early on in the, in the 80s, and uh, AT&T was essentially left with a long-distance business. And this was before wireless was ever heating up, and they really had to reinvent themselves. But back in 1922, <laughs> um, back in 1922, AT&T had a campaign where they planned to completely dominate the nation's system of broadcasting stations. Um, the telco's plan would have made it almost impossible for broadcast license holders not affiliated with AT&T to operate, and the plot involved an elaborate system of patent lawsuits, corporate alliances, and deals with local politicians. Now, does it sound kind of familiar with what's going on today? So as I read this article, 
there are so many parallels with what is happening in today's broadband space, uh, net neutrality. It's it's pretty remarkable, it really is. They they continue to do the same things, just you know, playing out of the same playbook. And you know, this is hey, well, this worked back in 1922. Let's or you know, we tried to do it in 22. We couldn't get it past them then. So let's try this in uh, in 2009. But I think if you go through, if, if any article you read tonight in any of the uh, in the show notes, um, definitely check this one out. And I'll call this AT and T hijack in the show notes. But definitely, it's a good read. It's going to take you five minutes to get through it, but it just goes to show you that uh, control of the airways, control of wireless, control of uh, messaging was really um, a lot of crazy things went back on in the twenties. And if it hadn't been for World War One prior to that, um, we could have seen uh, AT and T being a much bigger company today than uh, than what it is, uh, based upon you know world events that happened back then. So anyway, I have this link up in the show notes for you to uh, check out. That was a good read, made me smile, laugh, and uh, just kind of shake my head. Hey, lots of lots of action going on in space right now. Uh, a Soyuz had docked with the International Space Station. Uh, a Soyuz spacecraft carrying three new crew, three new crew members uh, docked with the orbiting post on Sunday. Now, that was followed by a 6 a.m. launch. I think 6.19 is what time it went down. Um, Space Shuttle Discovery uh, took off, and uh, this is the first time ever that uh, four women have launched at one time with a shuttle. So this is history's been made on this launch. So we've got uh, four ladies up there in orbit right now uh, with Discovery, and uh, so this is this is cool. Oh, actually, excuse me, three female astronauts launch. There's another lady on the International Space Station. So it'll be, this will be the first time there are four women in space. So excuse me on uh, uh, not being clear there, but. Um, Big announcement apparently happening on April 15th. The president is scheduled to go down to the Cape. No one knows what he's going to talk about. Um, there's some speculation that he may be trying to uh, – he may come down and give an extension to the shuttle. or No one knows. Everything's being very, very quiet about his, uh, his trip and what he's going to talk about. So there's been lots of uh, – Interviews going on about what's going to happen to NASA, what's going to happen to the astronaut corps. Um, obviously, we've got a few more shuttle missions left before we close the books on 30 years of, of uh, you know, basically space flight with the, with the space shuttle. But there's an article that was published on uh, an interview with uh, Charlie Bolden. Uh, Major General Charlie Bolden gave an interview to the BBC, which was tear-filled. And any of you that are space fans um, need to read this BBC article and read the article and, wa and basically watch the interview. It's four minutes and 17 seconds. And you can tell that there is big, big worry at NASA. Uh, there's a lot of people that this is going to have a major effect on our space program. And... Uh, I don't know if it's necessarily positive at this point, based upon, you know, what we're hearing out of the administration with the cancellation of so many different projects. Uh, of course, the White House wants to shut down development of the Orion cruise ship, its Ares launch rocket, and of course, with the rest of the moon-bound constellation program, which they've already spent six billion dollars on, and uh, they want to move some of that money into uh, private industry. So we'll see what happens with the U.S. space industry, but. The uh, this interview is wow. I watched it and uh, almost brought a tear to my eye. Now, we talked, of course, that uh, Discovery launched from uh, from the Cape today, and uh, they're bringing a plug and play micro lab to the International Space Station along with uh, a huge bunch of gear, oxygen, water, food, spare parts, you name it. Basically, the space shuttle now is in, uh, you know, hauling parts and stuff to the station to get them loaded out during the downtime where we won't have any lift compatibility, lift capa capability. But um, this uh, miniature laboratory is going to be plugged into a rack of 15 other cube labs, and uh, they're going to have um, 
a variety of different uh, experiments going on in this thing. So let me look back here. Now, to top it off, the the shuttle launch at the same time we're having a geomagnetic storm. So communications issues were uh, were prevalent uh, during the launch today, and uh, so also those of you that are relying on GPS, you may have had some problems with your GPS as well today, and uh, so this may last for a few days. Um, it was a pretty weak solar flare, but uh, enough to uh, cause some disruption. Right, let's move on to out of the science front, talk a little bit about USB 3.0. PC World has uh, got a rundown of some of the very first USB 3.0 native drives, and uh, we all knew this was coming. We've, we, of course, we had coverage of the very first external USB drive at uh, CES, and a lot of other companies are coming out with it. So there's some stuff you should know here. As you're getting ready to buy a new computer, you're going to want to be asking the uh, sales guy if it is USB 3.0 compatible. And uh, there's basically the USB port, I think, will be colored blue. It'll actually be a different color to indicate that it's a USB 3.0 port. Your USB 2.0 stuff will still work in the actual uh, slots. Uh, basically, what the USB 3.0 brings is, I think, five additional um, connector points. So, um, yeah, the actual connectors themselves as well will be blue on the inside. And uh, so, number of products. Uh, let me see here. Who was the companies that have announced? Uh, uh, Buffalo, iOmega, Seagate, Western Digital all have uh, some USB 3.0 drives available to be uh, purchased at this point. So, you know, be looking out for the hardware that will go along with it as well. Now, in the help and tech front, Science Daily has reported on a study that has determined that young men who smoke are, little, are likely to have lower IQs than their non-smoking peers. In a study conducted with 20,000 Israeli army recruits and veterans, the average IQ for a non-smoker was about 101, while the smoker's average was more than seven points lower at about 94. And the IQs of young men who smoke more than a pack a day were even lower at about 90. That is amazing. The difference between 90 and 101 is an average between smokers and non-smokers. Folks, I'm going to tell you, we all need as many brain cells as we can get. And if nothing else... You know, you, you know, not only is it stupid to smoke, it makes you stupid, <laughs> at least for young men. But uh, this is a – how long was the study that went on? Let me look and see how long of a timeline they had. It doesn't say in this short article. But uh, full study is available. So pretty amazing. Wow. Average of 101 to 90. Now, I'd like to see what the – the delta is for those that drink and don't drink. I wonder if they would come up with similar uh, uh, IQ ranges for drinking, but uh, definitely smoking is an issue. Um, article on uh, techdirt.com talking about the recording industry, basically telling, and this is a the IFPI, basically telling people, oh, you, you need to, to don't even um, – Pay attention to any of the other studies out there. They're nonsense. The, the information they're reporting is what they're what's happening is is that these recording industry organizations are now using a tactic of discrediting other studies that come out about peer to peer sharing, and so they do their very best to completely discredit them and get uh, sound bites and different articles saying. You know, that's pure speculation, means nothing, no valid research. And um, at the same time, trying to sell you with their studies, which probably has the same exact elements. So uh, kind of an interesting write-up here by the folks by Tech Dirt. Now, here's a question I want to ask all of you. If you went to uh, Borders or you have purchased a book on Amazon, if you actually have gotten a physical book, and actually a book that I just recently purchased was, let me see if I got it over here. Um, is by uh, Steve Garfield, 
It's called Online Video Secrets to Building Your Business. And uh, I know I've known Steve for a while and uh, picked his book up and I actually had it delivered hardbound from Amazon. So the New York Times has a editorial where a conversation's going on where a, a reader had written in and said, is it unethical to download an unauthorized copy of a physical book you own? So in other words, being that I've got Steve's book here, I paid whatever the list price was for it. I think it was 24 bucks. So you know, he got you know my full money's worth out of me on this. And, um, you know, while I like a good hardbound book to read, sometimes it's just easier to have it digital, right? Well, um, would it be unethical for me to go out and download this book if it was available somewhere digitally? Would that be copyright violation? And essentially, shockingly, the folks at the New York Times said, an illegal download is, a, is an ugly word. But in this case, it's not unethical. Author and publishers are entitled to be paid for their works, and by purchasing the hardcover, you did so. Your subsequent downloading is akin to buying a CD then copying it to your iPod. Now, imagine that uh, publishing executives were not exactly thrilled with this response. And uh, he goes on later in the article to quote... Uh, publishing execs who disagree with his thought process here and an account uh, basically uh, accounts unauthorized downloading to stealing. So what do you guys think? Do you think it's unethical? Do you think you have a right to? You paid for it? You bought it? Uh, you own it? Should you get the digital copy for free? Uh, love to hear you guys' feedback on that. Of course, if you have comments on anything tonight, geeknews at gmail.com. Voicemail hotline is 619 342 seven three six five um for those of you that are just tuning into the show we do the show every monday and thursday for a tuesday and friday release uh 99 percent of the audience that 99.9999 percent of the audience that uh uh tune in are subscribed and they get the audio podcast and a very small percentage of you actually watch so uh, definitely pick up the audio podcast and subscribe to it uh please do so that you don't miss an episode Hey, over again on Tech Dirt, can you imagine having done a crime, let's say, you know, 10 years ago, and the judge basically, when he sentenced you, said, not only are you going to go to prison for 10 years, uh, when you get out of prison, you are banned from using a computer for life. Well, you know, okay, the person goes, does his time, does his 10 years behind bars. Uh, he went to jail for some sort of, uh, you know, cyber crime. And then he gets out 10 years later, not having access to technology while he's been in prison. And now all of a sudden, um, he's been banned from life for using a computer. Is that fair in today's world? Well, apparently, uh, federal courts have overturned or, or are overturning such bans, saying it's an unfair encroachment on liberties and this happened in 2000 uh, another one of these cases was overturned like this in 2007 as well and i don't know what the what the crime was to be honest with you i don't know if it was a uh, a child predator i don't know if it was someone that just did cyber crime i don't know exactly the details here of uh, what these individuals did to uh, get time and be banned basically for life for using their computers but I'm kind of curious. What do you guys think? You know, everyone, uh, when they go to prison, do their time. They, they come out and uh, have to try to reintegrate in society. And if they can't use the tools of the day, it probably um, has a major impact uh, on those individuals trying to get jobs and actually get to uh, be a productive citizen again. So I'm kind of curious what you guys think. Do you think that uh, criminals should be... Um, Dependent, of, I guess, for my opinion at least, dependent on the crime would be the, uh, the restriction. But uh, do you think it's fair that judges are banning folks from using computers even after they get out of prison? So I'd love to hear your feedback on that as well. So I'm sure we're going to get some mixed response on that. All right, over on Wired, chain of offshore wind turbines could provide Atlantic seaboard power. 
Um, I didn't quite come out right, did it? Basically, there was a study done, and over the last uh, five years, what these guys determined that a, a an area of uh, 1,550 miles, if it was – actually, let me scroll this up for you. If they were to interconnect as many as 15 um, – as many as 15 different uh, wind turbine sites, in other words, basically clusters of, of windmills. If they were able to do that, they figured that they would have enough power based upon all those 15 sites and a variety of different wind uh, patterns that they could probably power the, a big portion of the eastern seaboard. Now, what they found, and this is pretty cool science here, is that even though some areas dropped and there was no wind across the 15 different stations where they took measurements, there was enough balancing to go on that they would um, stay pretty high in percentage of power available. And over the five-year period, um, the lowest the grid power output ever got to was 10%. Um, so that was pretty cool of a, of a, a study done. Now, sadly, at this point, there's not uh, a lot of science going on, or actually a lot of companies involved in bringing uh, uh, windmills to, you know, to the ocean, ocean currents, or you know, being placed in the ocean. There's a few that are starting up, and you can imagine the challenges there. Because what do you do? You put them on barges, or do you? Um, you have to make them so that they're embedded, uh, you know, very, very deep in these deep waters. You know, what are the challenges in actually putting a windmill out there? So. Um, very cool stuff, and I'm sure it would be very expensive to deploy, but if you are trying to get green, uh, this seems like a great way to do it. And uh, the meteorologists have figured out that, hey, there's enough wind out there in, those, in, the, in the ocean to make it happen. So uh, time will tell if this actually gets, uh, gets implemented. Another article today is a 95-million-year-old bug found in African amber surprised scientists. Uh, these folks uh, have discovered basically and get, been given a peek into Africa of 95 million years ago, and uh, they have found a specimen there that they say probably should not have existed at that time. So they're scratching their head a little bit on this one, so I'll have this link up in the show notes for you to, uh, to check out. All right, let's talk a little bit here about Android. I know many of you are big Android fans. And, uh, of course, you all get to brag the Android multitask very well. But uh, on Monday, market research firm Comscore released the state of the U.S. mobile market in a three-month period from November 2009 to February 2010. And one trend continues to be clear. Android continues to surge among smartphone uh, platforms. Now, while it's still, still in fourth place, more than it doubled its market share over those three months. So the Google Android platform went 3.5 went from 3.8% November to 9% in February 2010, and that's huge. So, um, of course, uh, uh, RIM, which is the BlackBerry, and Apple still dominate the report. Uh, RIM rose about 1.3%, while Apple actually dropped a little bit. And uh, But the biggest losers were Microsoft, which was down 4%, and, and Palm has just absolutely taken a beating and uh, continues to drop and go out of sight. All right, last article for tonight. Let me look where we're at in time. We got a bunch of uh, voicemails and emails to go into, but uh, T-Mobile is giving iPhone users $350 to defect to the HD2. A leaked memo shows that T-Mobile is hoping to lure iPhone users away with large incentive to switch to the HTC HD2 starting in April and running through May 19th. The clear plans to let any iPhone user get at least $100 credit and as much as $350 if they trade in a working device. So, um, wow, pretty cool. Now, it doesn't go into uh, any details whether or not you have to already be a T-Mobile user or if you're a current AT&T user, but uh, they're willing to put up big cash to get you to move. So that tells you this, uh, this mobile business continues to heat up. All right, let me go ahead and uh, get into the uh, to the voicemails here. And uh, everyone, thanks for those of you that are on Ustream. Thanks for hanging with me so far. And, uh, of course, those of you that are listening, uh, thanks for staying subscribed. All right, let me go ahead and play. I've got a couple of these that are pretty long. And the first one 
I think you guys will agree, you'll know who this is, and I always love when he sends in an audio comment. We'll play this one first, so here we go. And again, if you have comments of your own, 619-342-7365. Todd, how you doing? Hey. Brian here in Brooklyn. Hey, Brian. Can you hear that? Yeah. Those birds. I don't <laughs> know what you do. I mean, in Hawaii, you know, it's it, it should sound like you're in a rainforest or something. I know you don't have a AC in your studio, you mentioned. So I, I, how the heck do you keep the uh, bird sounds out? I mean, I'm in Brooklyn, you know. I got traffic noise, sirens kids in the street, boom boxes, but the damn birds, it's unbearable. I mean, I got to turn the gain down to keep the mics from picking them up. It sounds like I'm in an aviary or something, and it's not for a uh, lack of cats in the neighborhood. Um, a couple of listeners mentioned that your audio had been dropping out on a few shows. Yeah, I heard that. I wrote it off to uh, you doing some hasty editing or something. Could Maybe be. you were cursing at the hotel Wi-Fi or something. Absolutely. Um, are you recording with Windows 7? No. If you aren't, or you haven't yet, you might be in for a little surprise. Now, the sound mixer, as I knew it in XP, is completely gone. Um, I skipped Vista, but I believe it was still intact in Vista. But it seems like uh, Microsoft's attempt to simplify things has resulted in a really weird mixer. You know, the old one was completely logical. I just don't think logic is something that you need to simplify. But um, the problem seems to be, by Microsoft's own admission, and they also admit that there is no fix at this time, um, is that it's impossible to monitor real-time recording if you're using a USB microphone or an audio interface. I assume it's the same way for a FireWire interface. Um, I haven't tried mine yet. Uh, but there's a lag in uh, real-time recording that, that basically makes it uh, impossible. I think that you record analog through your sound card, so you should be okay after you get it figured out. It's going to take you a few minutes. After you try everything that makes sense, and then you go through a process of elimination, you, you'll get it working. Um, but on a similar subject, you know to get a good Skype interview, you need to do a mix minus recording with Skype on one device yep. and a separate device to do the recording and the hardware mixer in between, yep. right? Well, when I built this um, new Windows 7 box, when I was installing the sound card, I thought, well, why don't I leave the onboard sound enabled and use two sound cards for the mix minus instead of two computers or one computer and a uh, standalone digital recorder like I usually done in the past? Um, well, I tried it. Couldn't get it to work right. It, it seems like Skype just keeps changing my recording software settings, even though I have each program on its own sound card. Um, but, you know, when I researched the idea, I found a video from a fella doing just that on an iMac with two USB sound devices um, recording Skype with uh, GarageBand, I believe. So, anyway, this uh, Skypeosaurus, or, sorry, Ohanasaurus. Um, by the way, I really prefer Ohanatron. <laughs> now, I didn't enter that uh, name as a suggestion because I figured it was obvious and somebody would, would make that suggestion, but... Um, I just thought Tron seems more techy. It's all about video, you know, jumbotrons, yep. those kind of things. Um, I don't see the connection with giant reptiles and video casting equipment, <laughs> but um, Ohanatron. It even rhymes. But anyway, how do you do the audio part of that thing? Do you do a mix minus so the other users don't hear the, um, the echo of themselves? And uh, let us know if you're um, recording with Windows 7, what that's been like for you. All right, aloha. Ohanatron. 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 <laughs> Ohanatron. It does sound kind of cool, doesn't it? Hey, so far as the Ohanasaurus goes, um, there's two computers that are used. And uh, basically, I have a 16 channel Mac Daddy Mackie mixer back there. And what I do is um, basically, I use Aux Send to send the video to, or I send the audio to, for um, all the other channels to. Uh, the individual Skype computers, and then I just bring the audio directly out of the uh, PCs right into a channel on the board. Now, I do have to use uh, a line leveler. Um, I've got one laying here. Hang on. They're by EV Tech, and uh, let me see if I can hold it up to the right uh, screen here for those of you on Ustream, but it's called EV Tech. It's actually Hum Eliminator. These run about uh, 80 bucks a piece.
But what they do is they level the, the audio so that uh, when you have a PC that has a certain impedance and then a regular pro mixer with a certain impedance, it matches those and also drops out the hum. So EB Tech has a great variety of different products and products that I love. And I probably have four or $500 worth of this type of product, keeping all the noise out, keeping the cross hum from audio from basically invading the, the audio recording. It's still not perfect because I have audio being fed from this primary machine in front of me. Uh, it's going into a little cheaper mixer that drops into the main board, and I still get a slight hmm from that. It's about 10 dB, re really low, but uh, it's just one of those things. All right, thanks for your call. And, yeah, no Windows 7. The main machine that's recording the show is a Windows XP machine, and uh, it will run until it dies, and then I will be forced to upgrade and uh, uh, everything willing. The machine will run for many, many years. Um, just, you know, it works. Don't change what's not broke, right? <laughs> All right, here comes our next uh, next voicemail. Hey, Todd, this is Big Odie. Hey, Big uh, Odie. Just calling to tell you how I'm really enjoying my iPad. Good. Um, it's my first adventure with that type of Apple product. I just had that old iPod for a while. Now I got this new iPad. Um, I think uh, overall, pretty cool. I think uh, a lot of the college students would probably like it a whole lot better. better. Um, but yeah, I'm really enjoying it, learning it still, um, having a lot of fun with it. I uh, appreciate it. Uh, talk to you there. Hey, Big Odie, thanks for calling. And uh, yeah, that was our winner of, of the iPad that we gave away uh, last month. And uh, congratulations to him. And you know, you know, one thing you can always do there, Big Odie, if you get to the point where you don't like that thing, you put it on eBay, people overseas are going crazy on eBay right now buying iPads. So you, you actually might be able to make enough money to buy one and have some cash left over. So I know a lot of people did that, actually bought two and put one on eBay. So anyway, you know, enjoy it, though, no, ma no matter what. All right, here comes the next, uh, the next voicemail. Hey, Todd, this is Brennan from Philly. Hey. I've been reading your tweets lately and your updates and stuff, and I've been seeing that you're starting to you're like the iPad now that you got one. Yeah. Please tell me <laughs> you don't actually like this product. Please tell me they just got a couple cool features that got you interested, but it's still an overgrown iPhone. Please tell me that. Enjoy the show. Bye. It is definitely not an overgrown iPhone. Now, while the functionality is much the same don't get me wrong but when i actually try to read a book on my iphone no way i'm 45 i am not going to read a book on my iphone i don't like watching long videos i would have never watched 45 minutes of lost on my iphone i would have never have had leo laporte twit running for two hours on my iphone um, there's, again, I think this will, it all depends on what people come out with apps on and time will tell, but so far, mm, good purchase and we'll see, we'll see, we'll see if the coolness factor wears out or we'll see if this thing goes sky high. All right. Another one more, boy, we got another long voicemail here and then I have, uh, some email to get into. So we'll go ahead and play it. And we'll see how long this takes us. But, uh, guys, try to keep the uh, the phone calls to a couple minutes, okay, when you're calling into the uh, voicemail hotline. So here we go. Hey, Todd. It's Andrew Darlow. Hey, Andrew. Your resident pro photographer. Yeah. Uh, but probably not the only one out here in the GNC Ohana. I heard your uh, call out a couple days uh, back, and uh, you were speaking about the new Canon Rebel yeah. C2i. And based on the specs and the images I've seen from it, uh, it's really impressive. And at under $1,000 for a body, I think they even throw a lens in. Yep. It's just crazy. Um, just in the last five to ten years, things have just just gone at such a rapid pace. In fact, last year, the Canon 5D Mark II, which I use a lot, uh, at about $2,500 was groundbreaking. And then the 7D uh, was earth-shattering, and this is basically a 7D. Wow. And according to some tests, it's, uh, it's coming out with even sharper images. 
So uh, that PC Mag review you highlighted uh, is pretty well done. Uh, the Nikon uh, D5000, which you mentioned, also looks like a great camera. Expensive. I haven't actually used that one, but uh, especially as a still camera, it's it's an excellent value. Um, and I'll send you some links to more about the D5000 and also uh, the T2i and okay. the T1i. Um, but in both cases, the low-light performance is probably the biggest deal uh, because at high ISOs, uh, which you could never really get great pictures, like over 800 or 1600 ISO right. uh, with film or digital, now we can do that. Uh, oh. So that's a, a big, big difference. Uh, what bothers me a bit with both cameras are the limited video clip times. Uh, don't quote me, but from what I see, the Canon Rebel T2i, uh, you get about 12 minutes at oh. 1920 by 1080 and 18 minutes at uh, 1280 by 720, 24 minutes at 640 by 480. Now, that doesn't mean you can't hit the button again, Yeah. but often I'm recording you know, multiple takes, and I just don't want the camera to stop. So that's a big deal for me. Me too. Personally. Uh, from what I'm reading, the D5000 gets only five minutes at 1280 by 720. Really? And um, at other modes, you get, I think, 20 minutes. Uh, another big advantage of the Canon T2i is an external mic versus the D5000, which has an onboard mic only. That's, that's huge, as you know. Yeah. Um, also, manual video exposure on the Canon is a great feature because sometimes you just want to lock in exposure. I know I do. And it looks like, to me, the D5000 does not have that. I could be wrong, but from what I see, it does not have manual exposure so that you can't just turn off and just set it and uh, not have it vary if, if light changes. Uh, another advantage of the D5000 is an articulating LCD screen. So you can flip it down, and you get live view, and you can rotate it away from the camera. That's very cool especially if you're photographing things low to the ground. Uh, so kudos to them on that. Uh, both cameras have mini HDMI out, which is very nice. Uh, both record to SD cards, too. And the new Canon, I don't know if you saw this, but it, it can take SDXC cards, oh. which in the future say they can hold up to 2 terabytes. Right, right. Which is crazy. Um, <laughs> I'll send you a link the to that. The price will be crazy, and too. I have one other thing. On uh, the iPad front, I know you're waiting patiently for yours. Uh, you may not know, but I helped develop a, a bag called the Gallery Pouch with a company in Dallas, Texas. And these just look like clear bubble envelopes, but they can be made in any size from like 4 by 4 inches to like 52 by 156 inches. And uh, I developed it because I needed it for some exhibitions I was doing. And I don't know exactly what size will work for the iPad, but if people want something <laughs> to put their iPad in or even if they have like a nice case for it and they wanted to put it in to another one, a uh, gallery pouch might be perfect. And gallery pouch. At that size, it's probably under $10. Cool. So if you want to see a video of me talking all about it, people can go to gallerypouch.com. And I think you broke a Kindle a while back, yeah. right? Yeah. So uh, the gallery pouch uh, may just have helped. And what's cool is the bubbles are really hard to pop. And uh, they have all kinds of other uses, too. Anyway, that's enough for now. Have a good one. Thanks for everything. And aloha. Aloha, Andrew. Thanks for that. And I'm excited now about that Canon. I didn't realize it was that good of a camera. So that might be my new body then. Might be the way to go on that Rebel T2i. Hey, you know, as far as cases go, my iPad's here, but the case not arrived yet so i ordered all the accessories and <laughs> they, they they're getting here later in a week i guess all right let me go ahead and get an email here real quick or we're going to be crazy long um got a twitter from michael dell of course mike's uh, one of the uh, helps us out at uh, raw voice with tech support and he also posts over at geek new central from time to time he says hey todd it's a self it's a self addressed a self addressed stamped envelope there i feel better now you're right mike it is it's a self addressed stamped envelope if you guys want some swag from the show be signed up for the newsletter and send me a self-addressed stamped envelope <laughs> and i have to little star that one there so i don't goof that one up too i got an email from uh from jacob he says from sweden he said hey todd well listen to your last show i got an idea aren't you interested in vista 7 sidebar gadget I thought it would contain links to a few of the last entries on GNC, plus small banner at the bottom, 
could be used to display live button directly over to Ustream Player. I think it would be quite cool. Jacob, I haven't heard from you. Yes, let's do something. Very, very cool. Um, got an email, of course, from Andrew, followed up with sending me some stuff. He said, hey, I thought, you'd, I thought of you when I saw this great gallery. And what it is, it's uh, some space shuttle pictures. And I actually changed up one of my backgrounds because of that. And he also goes on to talk about the cable cards. He says, also, you asked about cable cards. I have cable cards, but not in my TV. I have a dual cable card in my TiVo HD, and on top of that, to get some HD movie channels, they had to put a tuning adapter box, each of which required a technician to install. On top of that, much of the content on TiVo is protected, so I can't convert it for viewing on my iPod Touch. I thought uh, that perk would be guaranteed for spending over $1,000 a year for cable and TiVo entertainment. And on top of that, with two TiVos in the house, you're supposed to be able to see each other's content on them. No go. It didn't work before the tuning adapters were installed, and we are told it won't work with a tuning adapter. That brings me that brings me to this question. If I want to go back, if I want to back up my movies and put them on a hard drive, is there an expensive box, inexpensive box I can just plug into the TV to view the content? I don't want another TiVo. Sounds like the Roku box might work for streaming. And Pop Box looks good too. Any suggestions? Apple TV perhaps? All the best. Andrew, I don't know. You can't you can't record anything onto the Roku. Everything's set in channels. Uh Apple TV maybe. And I think Pop Box is gonna be the similar type of app as the Roku but or Boxy. So I don't know. We'll see if we can get someone to answer up. Maybe someone else has some questions or some answers for, on that. Get an email from Henry. Say, hey, Todd, couldn't help notice that you're having the trouble you're having with Pawn. This article may help. The Pawn to Own competition is usually pronounced as if it were written, Pawn to Own. <laughs> where the first ri word rhymes with the last word. Are you and your mom still doing sherry cast? Happy Easter to you and your family, Henry in Livonia, Michigan. Yes, we still are. We just haven't done one forever. Um... Oh, I actually got another e a voicemail from Tom. Tom, we're going to have to play this on... Uh, let's see if I can actually drop this over here. See if this will actually work. Uh, no, it didn't. So can I save that real quick and bring it... Let me put it over there. And it's add file. This actually... Oh, can I play this? Let me go ahead and... Hi, Todd. This is Tom from hey. the Fogview Podcast. Hey, Tom. And uh, just listened to GNC 564. Yeah. Where you talked about your early Navy days in uh, Millington, Tennessee. And that brought back memories because I was went to boot camp and A school in Millington. Yeah. Uh, this is back in the early 70s, probably a little before you were there. But uh, like you, I had electronic training before I went into the service. I was an amateur radio operator. I still am, and also took electronic courses and uh, in high school and college. So I went into uh, A school. I went into the avionics uh, division. So the electronic courses I, I took, I think I aced the first one. So they put me into a fast track program, which cool. sounded like what you were doing also, yeah. uh, where they put you in a room with other students, and it's pretty much self-paced yeah. for for doing the rest of the of the course. I uh, came back, I uh, was stationed at NAS Alameda. I was a weekend warrior, so I wasn't in the Navy full-time, and I was doing that for for six years, but uh, got involved in a helicopter squadron. Cool. It was anti-submarine Sikorsky SH-3s. Uh -huh. And I definitely agree with you about uh, air, military airplanes having their own special smell to them. <laughs> yeah, they do. Commercial planes. And also just being very bare bones. I mean, you go into these planes and... They're just the bare necessities. Uh, you won't find much soundproofing, and you pretty much... Uh, uh, it, it's a different experience, but uh, Your definitely very enjoyable. I uh, worked on the flight line, worked on the avionics, uh, traveled a little bit, and uh, it was definitely a uh, an enjoyable experience in my life. All right. Uh, anyway, uh, great show. Keep up the work. Good work. And uh, you can find me at uh, fogview.com. I have a podcast there. And uh, also, this is being recorded on a... Oh, oh, can't say how that was being recorded on. <laughs> uh, Tom, thanks for that. I appreciate it. Um, 
he also Tom writes over at Geek News Central as well. He wrote up an article on his experience with an iPad, so you definitely want to check that out. I got an email here from uh, Ron. He says, hey, Todd, Apple has already been granted two Pico projector-related patents in the past, iPhone with a projector and a Pico projector system. Today we learned that they have a new patent showing a Pico projector-enabled MacBook. Apple locates the projector on the side of the laptop so you can work while projecting. So, Ron, this might be coming to a MacBook or to uh, our phones at some point. Uh, we'll, we'll see what happens here. Got an email from Chuck. He says, hey, went to the Apple store on Saturday with a friend who was going to purchase an iPad. Ended up walking out of the store with a 64-gig unit of my own. I'm a longtime PC user and, and use a Droid, but as much as I hate to say it, I really like this iPad. The Kindle app is great, so my Kindle will now be retired. Netflix also works well, as does the ABC app. Its screen and sound quality is excellent. US Today is free until July and also looks great with no comparison to the Kindle version. In short, no regrets from this first time Apple user. By the way, enjoy the podcast. Chuck in Florida sent for my iPad. Very, very cool. Jack, he's, this email from Jack, he says, Todd, I was listening to your podcast when Chrome was crashing and suspected a rogue web page was causing the error. I thought of readability, which I recently found. David, David Pogue of the New York Times listed this as one of the 2009 2009 year's best tech ideas. His description, it's a free button for your web browser toolbar. Get it at, I have the link here. When you click it, readability eliminates everything from the web page you're reading except the text and photos. No ads, blinking lights, banners, promos, or anything. Times Square just goes away. You wind up with a symbol like magazine layout presented in a beautiful font against a white or off-white background with another red text against black business. You occasionally run into a web page that has readability that doesn't handle right. No big deal. Just refresh the page. So I also thought this might eliminate some of the browser crashing problems. Oh, also, it makes the web page you're reading from more readable. What a concept. Especially to JavaScript. Who knew you could put a JavaScript button on your links toolbar? This is really very cool. Hope it helps. Readability and Arc90 Lab Experiment. Thanks for that, Jack. And Jack, of course, was our cameraman out in, uh, in Vegas and uh, retired airline pilot as well. A uh, second email from Jack. He says, Jack, he says, Todd, you asked about cable cards. I have Verizon Files as my cable service provider. Verizon has non-standard cable video signal set up, so none of my TVs nor my Windows Media Center tuner can directly tune any cable signal beyond channel 50, so I must have a set-top box to see any channel above 50. None of my TVs are cable card capable, so I must use a set-top box of some kind to see Verizon's video. They charge $19 a month for a Motorola HD STV DVR that I have major problems with and is frustrating me to the max. I really don't like them. So about a year ago, I purchased a couple of TiVo HD units. These units have two cable card slots. I called Verizon, asked them to send me two cable cards, required a technician to come out the house and saw them. He did. They work great, and the Motorola STVs are gone. These cable cards do not have do not have two-way communication with Verizon, so I'm unable to access any video on demand channels. But it is okay since I never use them anyway. It couldn't be happier with my TiVo and cable cards. I would recommend them to I would recommend them to anybody. And again from Jack. Got an email from Jason here. He's oh Jason, the iPhone app design. We got about another week or so, so don't worry. Don't uh, don't rush. Just get your design in with the, within a week here. And that's for our iPhone app contest. Got an email from Eric. Said, Todd, I never heard you mention Play On any of your shows before. I want to make sure you're aware of this. It allows people to stream Hulu, Netflix, and CBS, and countless other web video sources to many DNLA-compliant devices, and the most notable being PS3, Xbox 360, and also supports the Wii. So I'm assuming that you're that in the future, Raw Voice will be moving to putting many of their web content and services like Roku, Boxy, etc. I think it's important you also look at software that, as it has full API, to build your channels, and in my opinion, right now is the best web streaming solution available. Boxy will be better once it works out works a number of its, works out a number of its kinks. You can find more about the software at PlayOn.tv, and they have a plugin developer message board at PlayOnPlugins.com. I'm not affiliated with PlayOn anyway; just a huge fan. Regards, Eric. Thanks for that, Eric. Very cool. Uh, got an email here on Twitter. He oh, this is. Uh, an article where we might be able to put Wi-Fi, actually, you know, basically enable Wi-Fi in a Windows 7 machine. Um, also, I get an email here from Bill in uh, Pennsylvania. Todd, I know how much you like NASA. Thought you might like this shot. Keep up the great work you do, Bill. And he gives me a Space Shuttle Discovery launch, 10-second exposure. Very, very cool stuff. All right, we're way long, crazy long. Thanks, everybody, for hanging out. 
Everyone be good. Be back with you Thursday for a regular show. Geeknews at gmail.com is the email address. Geeknews at gmail.com. Voicemail hotline 619-342-7365. 619-342-7365. Back to the regular content off the iPad Mini on the next show. Uh, thanks for hanging. Everyone be, be good. Be safe out there. Uh, support the sponsors. Definitely appreciate you all hanging out. And, uh, hey, come over to Geekness Central throughout the week and check out all the great content. Everyone take care and aloha.